What did you say? From Vermont is recognized. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Madam President, um, since last week, uh, the Senate has been quote unquote debating. Senator, uh, we're in a quorum call. I would ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. Madam President, uh, since last week, uh, the Senate ostensibly um, one of the great deliberative bodies in the world, supposedly, has been quote unquote debating the $740 billion National Defense Authorization Act. It's been a very, very silent debate uh, because of the 700 amendments that have been filed to this bill. Uh, there has been no roll call votes on any of them. I do understand that in the manager's amendment, some of the non-controversial, non-significant amendments have been accepted and absorbed, and that's fine. Uh, but we have had a vigorous, vigorous debate, but nobody in the world has heard that debate because there's not been one amendment here on the floor. And knowing the way the Senate does business, I worry very much, and I hope I am wrong, and I'll do my best to prevent it, but I worry very much that we are supposed to be getting out of here for July 4th uh, break uh, tomorrow night. And right now it is 2 o'clock, a little after 2 o'clock on Wednesday, out of here on Thursday. I'm, I'm just a little bit worried that given the fact that we are talking about 53 percent of the discretionary budget of the United States of America, I'm just a little bit worried about how many real amendments, significant amendments, are going to be offered. Um, and let us be clear uh, that over the last year, uh, we have been part of what I consider to be the biggest do-nothing Senate in the modern history of this country. Uh, this fa country faces enormous crises in terms of a pandemic, face enormous crises in terms of an economic meltdown, enormous crises in terms of racial injustice and police brutality, enormous crisis in terms of being the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people as a human right, enormous crises, and that in Siberia last week, the temperature was 100 degrees, which is frightening the scientific community because they understand this is the tip of the iceberg regarding climate change. So we had all these crises out there, and nothing much happens here in the United States Senate. Well, you know, I think maybe it might be a good idea to start some real debate right here. And I have introduced <clears throat> six amendments, and I will discuss each of them, that are significant. Other members, Democrats, Republicans, have also introduced significant amendments. Now, given the fact we have done virtually nothing over the last year, I think it is not inappropriate to have some serious debate on one of the very major pieces of legislation that we will be dealing with. Uh, Madam President, we are talking about a bill that will spend some $740 billion. That is more money in terms of military spending than the next 11 nations combined. Anybody have a problem with that? Well, some of us do. Maybe others don't. Let's debate it. We're talking about a bill that will be spending more money on the Pentagon than we did during the height of the Cold War and the height of the wars in Vietnam and Korea. Anyone have a problem with that? Well, I do. Maybe some other people do. Maybe you don't. Tell me why you think we should be spending more money on the military today in terms of inflation than we did during the war in Vietnam. Let's debate it. We are talking about a bill that will provide 53 percent 
of the entire discretionary budget to the bloated and wasteful Pentagon at a time when the Defense Department cannot even pass an independent audit. We got a huge budget for the Pentagon. They cannot pass an independent audit. And the response of the Senate is, well, let's give them even more money. May make sense to some people, doesn't make sense to me. In my view, it would be rather disgraceful for us to leave town, recess the Senate for two weeks without getting a vote on a single amendment, and then come back in a couple of weeks to pass a $740 billion defense bill without any opportunity to amend that bill. <coughs> Madam President, if the horrific pandemic that we are now experiencing, where tens and tens of thousands of people are coming down with the virus every single day, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is that national security, the well-being of our people, protecting our people, is a lot more than just building bombs and missiles and jet fighters and tanks and submarines. Our people are in trouble today in an unprecedented way with the pandemic, with an economic meltdown in which tens of millions of people have lost their jobs over the last couple of months. And we have got to focus on how we protect those people. And it's not just spending money on planes and guns and bombs. <clears throat> Madam President, in order to begin the process of addressing some of the most important issues facing uh, our country, I have introduced five amendments, all of which I think are important and all of which I believe need to have a vote and a debate. And let me very briefly explain uh, what those amendments are and what they would do. First Amendment would reduce the military budget by 10 percent and use that $740 billion in savings to invest in distressed communities in every state in this country that have been ravaged by extreme poverty, mass incarceration, deindustrialization, and decades of neglect. <coughs> it is no secret to anybody that the American people are hurting, but all across this country, we have communities where unemployment today is 20, 25, 30 percent, where people are sleeping out on the streets, where schools are underfunded, where decent quality childcare is virtually not available, where air and water pollution are rampant. And it is time that we stop turning our backs on those communities. So what we are doing right now is focusing attention on the fact that 40 million Americans are living in poverty. Half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. And maybe, just maybe, instead of investing more money in nuclear weapons and submarines, and God knows what else, maybe we want to invest in our own people, in jobs, in health care, in education, so that they can live their lives with dignity and security. I believe right now, in the midst of all of the crises that this country faces, the crisis of the pandemic, the crisis of the economic meltdown, the crisis of racial injustice, the crisis of 100 million people being uninsured or underinsured, the crisis of climate change. I think the American people want real transformation. They're tired of the status quo. They want a government which represents all of us, not the 1% and wealthy campaign 
contributors. And I do understand that the people behind this military budget who love it so much are the military industrial complex and the defense contractors. They are doing phenomenally well. It's a great budget for them. Their CEOs make tens of millions of dollars a year. They make huge profits every single year. It's a good budget for them. But maybe we may want to get our priorities right and have a good budget for working families and low-income families in America. And that is what my amendment does. And that amendment is being co-sponsored by Senators Markey and Warren. It is also being supported by over 60 organizations throughout this country, representing millions and millions of people. Organizations like Public Citizen, Union of Concerned Scientists, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the Coalition of Human Needs. And what these organizations are saying that maybe, just maybe, instead of investing in weapons of destruction, instead of spending more money on the military than the next 11 nations combined, maybe we should invest in our people. <coughs> and what this amendment would do is provide funding, again, for 1,000 distressed communities from Vermont to Oklahoma who would receive federal funding to hire more public school teachers, provide nutritious meals to children and parents, offer free tuition to public colleges, universities, or trade schools. Madam President, at this pivotal moment in American history, we have to make a fundamental decision. Do we want to continue spending billions on endless wars in the Middle East? on weapons of mass destruction of which we have more than enough? Or do we provide decent jobs and education and health care for millions of people in our country? Further, Madam President, a major reason why there is so much waste, fraud, and abuse at the Pentagon is, in fact, that the Defense Department remains the only federal agency in America that hasn't been able to pass an independent audit. So that deals with the second amendment that I have introduced. I don't think it is too much to say to the largest agency of the federal government that you have to pass an independent audit. There is nobody in the Senate who does not believe that there is massive waste and fraud at the Pentagon. Defense contractor after defense contractor has pled guilty to fraud. We have massive overrun, cost overruns. And all that that Second Amendment that I'm offering does, which is co-sponsored by Senator Grassley, longtime Republican leader here, uh, Senator Lee, Republican from Utah, uh, and Senator Wyden of Oregon and myself, all that we're asking is that there be an independent uh, audit of the uh, Defense Department uh, and that that be completed no later than fiscal year 2025. Not a very radical idea. Now, the Third Amendment that I'm offering, I think, is one that I would hope and expect would have wide support right here, and I think does have support among the American people and certainly has widespread support among the medical community and the epidemiologists of this country. Just yesterday, I was participating in a hearing of the Health Education Labor Committee. And we had the leading experts in this country, including several representatives of the Trump administration, uh, Dr. Fauci and others, talking about the pandemic and what we can do about it. And there was widespread consensus. Nobody, I think, has any doubt anymore, maybe except Donald Trump, that masks are a very, very important uh, preventative measure not going to solve all of the problems. But the evidence is overwhelming that people who wear masks in the public when they're around other people are less likely to transmit the virus or receive the virus. Nobody doubts that anymore. So the question that we have got to ask ourselves is how does it happen that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, the strongest economy in the world, 
We have doctors and nurses today who are dealing with people with COVID-19 who don't even have the personal protective equipment that they need. How in God's name does that happen? We're spending 18% of our GDP on health care, twice as much as any other country, and yet we cannot provide a dollar mask to a doctor or a nurse whose life is at stake. But it's not only doctors and nurses. What a number of countries around the world are doing, which is very smart, is they are producing or acquiring large numbers of high-quality masks, and they're distributing those masks to all of the households in their country. We should be making sure that every household in this country has the masks that they need. That will save us lives. There's an estimate from the University of Washington. It could save 30,000 lives in this pandemic if 95% of the American people wore masks, and it would save us substantial sums of money because it's a lot cheaper to invest in masks than in hospitalization for those who have the virus. And I should mention that other countries not as wealthy as we, countries like South Korea, France, Turkey, Austria, and others are doing just that. And again, this is an idea that won support not only from Dr. Fauci, but other leading healthcare experts who testified before the health committee yesterday. So that's the Third Amendment, making sure that we utilize the Defense Production Act to produce the masks that our medical professionals need and the American people need. We can save tens of thousands of lives and hundreds of billions of dollars by doing that. Fourth Amendment I have filed, Mr. President, Madam President, will prohibit funding for military aid and logistical support for the disastrous Saudi-led war in Yemen. I believe it is past time that we put an end to our unconstitutional and unauthorized participation in this war. And on this issue, I am certainly not alone. A bipartisan majority of the U.S. Senate has already voted three times, not once, not twice, three times, to halt all U.S. military support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. It is time for us to do that again. This time, not just in words, but in action, no money going toward U.S. participation in this horrible war, which is destroying some of the, a nation of some of the poorest, most desperate people on Earth. So that's the Fourth Amendment. And I think it would be hard for anybody here to deny that that is an important amendment, because it's already been in one form or another passed three times. So let's get some teeth into it. And the last amendment that I have filed, Madam President, Mr. President, I'm sorry, uh, would reduce the defense budget by one-tenth of one percent. One-tenth of one percent. Not a lot of money. And use that money to make our nation safer by reaching out to people throughout the world by expanding educational and cultural exchange programs. In other words, the theory behind this whole bill is that by spending $740 billion building planes and tanks and guns and the most sophisticated weapons of mass destruction in the history of the world, that will make us safer. Well, I'm not so sure. Maybe what makes us safer is when we break down the fears and the hatred that exists between peoples all over the world. Maybe what makes us safer is when we get to know each other. That as human beings, whether we're Chinese or Russians or Iranians or Brazilians or Canadians, maybe we all share the same human aspirations. Throughout history, it has always been easy to demonize people you don't know. Always easy. That's what demagogues always have done. We're fearful of Jews and blacks and Irish and Italians and gay people. So easy to demonize people we are not comfortable with and we don't know. They're not in our community. We don't know anybody. 
Let's demonize the people in Iran. Let's demonize the people in China and Russia, which is not saying that I or anybody else here is in agreement with their policies. But are weapons the only approach we have toward them? Yeah, we need a strong military. I believe in a strong military. But you know what I also believe? Is that when we have kids from the United States going to other countries, and when other countries are sending their kids, their farmers, their doctors, their nurses to America, when we get to know each other, we got a shot to break down the irrational hatred which foments so many problems throughout the world. I can tell you, as a former mayor, and I'm not alone, this idea of sister cities is certainly not a radical idea. I suspect that almost everybody here in the Senate comes from a state where sister city programs exist. You have programs with cities in other countries. In Vermont, we have a number of them. I started several of them when I was mayor of Burling. And it was a beautiful thing to see. Kids from another country coming to our country, our people going to other countries, learning. All I'm asking for is one-tenth of one percent, seven billion dollars. No, less than that. What am I talking about? Seven hundred million dollars to encourage cultural and educational exchange programs. By taking this tiny fraction, one-tenth of one percent, from our defense budget and applying it to these exchange programs, we will send a message about the critical role that these exchange programs, which exist all over this country already, but I want to see them grow, play in supporting not only American security, but our common global security. Therefore, I listed and described uh, five amendments. Therefore, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to set aside the pending amendment and call up the following amendments on block. Senate Amendment Number 1788, Number 1920, Number 1789, Number 1990, 1919, I'm sorry, 1919, and Number 1918 that they be reported by number, and further, that there be two hours of debate on the amendments, equally divided and controlled by me or my designee, and Senator Inhofe or his designee, and that following the use or yielding back of that time, the Senate vote on adoption of the amendments in the order listed without intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Uh, Right to object. The Senator from Oklahoma. Let me see the, uh... Senator Inhofe, did you have anything else that you wanted to say on this? Uh, and I will object although I'd like to have the opportunity to look at all five of these amendments to see which ones would not be consistent with the negotiation that is taking place right now. I'd like to make sure that everyone understands Democrats and Republicans at this very moment are looking at a lot of amendments as we've done every year for 60 years and to make sure that we're getting the right amendments to make the bill the best bill that we can have. Now, uh, just take a few minutes for me to uh, uh, do this, and, and until then, I'd reserve the right to object. And if it's uh, if we, we have a timing problem on this, I would object. But it might be there's one that I, I would I would in, I'd like to consider at this time. Well, okay. is there objection? All right, then I, I object. Yeah. Objection is heard. Yeah, I'd like to be recognized too, just to make a comment. First of all, I have a great deal of respect for the gentleman. I have worked with him many times, and we've uh, really gotten quite a bit uh, uh, accomplished. I know that uh, my friend is sincere in the statements that he makes. 
I find it myself in a different position. I look and I see what has happened in previous administrations, and I saw that during the last five years of the Obama administration, when he, uh, the president in his budget reduced the military by 25% at the same time that China was increasing theirs by 83% and, and uh, Russia was increasing theirs by uh, 34%. I uh, am sensitive to this and this is one of the considerations we make. So I do object uh, to this amendment, but I am going to work with the gentleman and to see which of these might be appropriate and can be sellable to a majority of the people in the Senate. Mr. President? I, th I think you have this. Senator from Vermont. Well, Senator Inhofe is right. He and I have known each other for a number of years, and I think we respect each other. We have very, very different philosophical leanings, uh, but that doesn't mean we cannot respect each other. And all that I would say to my friend from Oklahoma is that the function of the Senate is for 100 members to determine what's important, not just a few. And what may not be important to me may be important to you, it may not be important to you, may not be important to me. But I think, especially on a bill of this significance, the members, Democrats and Republicans, <clears throat> have a right to come forward and bring forth an amendment. And if I don't like the amendment, you bring forth an amendment, likely it is I'm going to vote against it. You're going to vote against my amendment. I get it. That's called democracy. It's called the process we go through here. But I just cannot understand why we are not voting on amendments. So I would rather see a process take place when we get back where dozens of amendments are brought up and debated, voted up, voted down. That is what I think this Senate is supposed to stand for. Uh, for one more comment addressing that, uh, Senator Reid and I both are in agreement. We've been wanting amendments. We've been asking on a daily basis now for about two months of people to bring their amendments down so we can consider amendments. And we're in the process now of seeing which amendments we're able to uh, bring up that we, we might have uh, reached an agreement. And we're doing that. It's not an easy process. It does take a little bit of time, but I encourage, uh, I'm hopeful that we'll have amendments. I anticipate we will. All right, if, if I may respond to my friend, is that I, you know, Jack Reed is a good friend of mine, and I know that you and he are working hard and well together. But you are two senators. There are 98 others of us. And what you two may agree is important or not important, others may disagree. And all that I'm saying, Senator Inhofe, is let people bring up their amendments. You don't like it, I don't like it, we'll vote against it. But I just don't know why we are restricting amendments uh, in a Senate which is supposed to be uh, one of the great deliberative bodies in the world. The world is supposed to look at us. And they're not looking well at us when a few people determine what is going to be voted on or not. I'd respond by saying I don't take issue with that, but I would say this. Uh, we all remember what happened a year ago uh, when this bill was up. One of our members uh, objected to all amendments coming up, and uh, as a result, no one got their amendments up. That isn't happening this year because that the individuals who are opposed to amendments last year are no longer opposed to amendments. We're just trying to, we, with the understanding and the, the realization that things are done in the Senate with unanimous consent and that one person has a lot of power to stop a lot of other people, we don't want that to happen. Uh, we want to encourage amendments, and we're going to try to consider as many as we can. I would simply say to my friend, I, he is quite right, unanimous consent gives every member a lot of power. Yes. And I do not want to be objectionable, but I feel very strongly on this issue, and I hope that we can work out something. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, uh, Mr. President, I would uh, yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Washington. Mr. President, I come to the floor to continue this debate about the armed services bill that we are considering on the floor today. And I would just note for my colleagues that I know that it's a general practice, but my colleague from Vermont is bringing up a very big, important point about amendments. And that is that the NDAA is marked up in a secret closed door session. It's not like we all have a bright